Oh, thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. And it's fantastic to see so many people out here. Uh, this is a just a, what, a, what a turnout. And I hope that a lot of you are here because of this subject matter, which is just enduringly fascinating and wonderful. And I was just delighted to be asked by the book club to speak. And they said, what do you want to talk about? And I just thought, I want to talk about the hidden waters of San Francisco, because this is a subject that I, just brings joy, not only to my heart, but I think it brings joy to the hearts of everyone who begins to go down this, this road. So <clears throat> uh, I'm going to sort of do a two-part uh, talk tonight. Uh, the first part, I'm going to read a chapter from my book, Cold Ray City of Love, which will give, a, I think, a sense of just what it, why it is that waters appeal to me and perhaps appeal to all of us, waters in cities especially, but waters uh, universally. And, uh, and then I'm going to uh, go to the second part, which is going to cover two of the most blissfully uh, delightful days that I ever spent um, wandering around looking for water with uh, a group of experts, of people that really know what they're talking about. I don't. I just have curiosity and love. And one of those people we're fortunate enough to have here tonight, Joel Pomerantz, the gentleman sitting in that chair there. Joel, stand up and take a bow. <clears throat> Joel is the author and compiler of the wonderful Seep City book and Atlas, and he created this amazing map that you can see in the front. Uh, he also gives these great walks called Think Walks, where he walks around and talks about all kinds of things about San Francisco. But uh, Joel, what is it, 30 years, I believe, that you've been obsessed with this subject? <laughs> Do I have to confess this publicly? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's uh, something like that, right? Yeah, so Joel <clears throat> was definitely the, uh, the Dante to my Virgil on this walk. And there were some other gentlemen that, that came along that I'll, I'll describe in, in due course. And, and so in, in when we come to that part, we'll be going through the city and, and talking about some of the things we discovered. And it'll be kind of a grab bag approach. Um, I'm not going to pretend to bring any great hydro hydrological knowledge. I'll leave that to Joel. Um, it would be foolish of me to attempt to do that when there's an expert in the house. But, uh, but I can talk about s some of the history and some of the, uh, just the beauty of what we saw. So I'm gonna start uh, with this chapter 10 from Cool Gray City of Love. Um, in my book, every chapter is set in a different specific location, and this one is called The Lost River, and it's set at a little, funny little park called Huffaker Park at 6th and Channel Streets. San Francisco is famous for its natural beauty, but to call its beauty natural is slightly misleading. For aside from the cliffs at Land's End, which are actually covered with introduced trees, Glen Canyon, and a few other places, its beauty does not derive from nature in its pure state. The paradoxical truth is that before the city existed, its terrain was not particularly beautiful. Covered in sand dunes and with scant trees, it was a monotonous, even dreary landscape, largely devoid of color and contrast. Heretical as it is to say, much of San Francisco's terrain became more attractive when the city was built. San Francisco is the urban equivalent of an English garden, an artful blend of wildness and cultivation. But there is one part of the city's primordial landscape that was breathtakingly beautiful and whose loss was tragic, its vanished waters. Compared with the East Bay or the peninsula, San Francisco in, say, 1700 co common era, 1700 AD, as they used to say, was fairly arid. It had no streams as large as Alameda Creek, which runs for 45 miles and drains 700 square miles, or 15 mile long Butano Creek in San Mateo County. But it had plenty of live water, 
four or five significant free-flowing streams, and there may be more than that, uh, Joel can attest. Uh, numerous springs, according to Joel, there are now 20 accessible springs still in San Francisco, so who knows how many there were in this era. And more than a dozen lakes, at least 14 of them in what is now Golden Gate Park. And of all of its aquatic features, perhaps the most magnificent was an estuary called Mission Bay. This vast tidal cove, which is clearly visible in old bird's eyes illustrations of the city, took up much of what is now south of Market and ran deep into the Mission District. Fed by a meandering creek that wandered as far to the south and west as 20th and Florida, Mission Bay was surrounded by 260 gloriously squishy acres of salt marshes, mud flats, and serpentine streams. These nutrient-rich wetlands were home to an enormous bird population, including ducks, egrets, ospreys, seagulls, and herons, and supported a rich population of mussels and clams. Fish were abundant, as were small game. Not surprisingly, the native people, the Yalamu, or Ramaytush, were drawn to Mission Bay. The 49ers, in fact, had a saying that wherever there was fresh water, one would find Indian artifacts. The Yalamu had a winter village on Mission Bay, near today's AT&T Park, and a summer village a few miles west on Mission Creek, near Mission Dolores, named Chuchui. They could travel by boat between these villages on Mission Creek, a route still practical when the 49ers arrived. Nancy Olmsted recounts the saga of this lost world in Vanished Waters, a history of San Francisco's Mission Bay. During the 19th century, the cove was home to San Francisco's shipbuilders and later the city's little-known whaling industry. A rope plant, an ironworks, and a sugar refinery stood on the cove's southern tip, Petrero Point, near present-day 3rd and 16th Streets. The thousands of Chinese immigrants that poured into the city disembarked at the Pacific Mail steamship pier, near what is now 1st and Brannan. But the waterways weren't only used for business. They were precious lungs for a city that had almost no parks. Long Bridge, the almost mile-long bridge that spanned three-quarters of the cove, was a favorite site for picnics and Sunday outings. Hunters wearing gum boots shot snipe in the marsh at 7th and Mission, where the old post office is. At the edges of the marshes, resorts like Russ Gardens at 7th and Harrison, and the Willows at 17th and Valencia, which pleasure goers reached by going out the Mission Plank Road over the sand dunes, offered outdoor dining and dancing. But Mission Bay was as doomed as the more famous cove to its north, Yerba Buena Cove, where the instant city first expanded. Flat downtown land was scarce. The hills and dunes blocked expansion. There was big money to be made in real estate. The omnipotent railroads needed space. And Mission Bay and its wetlands were in the way. As Philip J. Dreyfus notes in Our Better Nature, Environment and the Making of San Francisco, San Franciscans seemed quite consumed by the concerns that their city had been graced with too much water and too little earth. In 1852, a San Franciscan named David Hughes invented the steam paddy, the steam shovel railroad combination capable of moving 2,500 tons of sand a day, and so named because it could supposedly do the work of numerous Irishmen. They were not politically correct in those days. <laughs> the enormous dunes that blocked Markin and Mission Street, some as high as 80 feet, including right near Union Square, were cleared away and dumped in marshes and wetlands. By 1874, Mission Creek above 9th and Brannan was no longer classified as navigable. By 1889, most of Mission Bay had been filled in. By 1910, the job was finished. 
Today, the entire majestic cove, its creek and its glorious marshes are gone. All that is left is a short stretch of Mission Creek, which opens onto the bay just south of the giant stadium, passes under two historic counterweighted bridges, and runs west four blocks to 7th and Barry, where it abruptly ends at a wastewater pump just before the Caltrain tracks. The gigantic gray arch of the 280 freeway towers like a brutalist amusement park ride above the western end of the creek, its mighty pylons walking across the stunted waterway. I first came upon this unexpected stretch of water one night in the early 1970s. This whole part of town was part of what was once a vast world where the sidewalk ended. Near where AT&T Park now stands, there was a string of ancient warehouses, unchanged since the days of Harry Bridges. Nearby, a riotous old bar, appropriately named Bouncers, catered to a bruising clientele, a Jack Daniels pounding mixture of bikers, rockers, and longshoremen. Management would have needed major bouncers, plural, to 86 any of these dudes. Vast, empty fields stretched out to the south, the biggest open space in San Francisco. On the north side of the creek stood the sketchy San Francisco RV park. But this strangely truncated body of water was not just a surreal afterthought. A few people called it home. On the south side of the channel, I was enchanted to discover the last thing I thought I'd see a few blocks from the train station, a motley collection of houseboats. I wandered down along the less than perfumed banks of the creek, past the last houseboat, under the freeway. No one was around. A rotting board stretched out into the water. I walked onto it. After I had gone about six feet, it suddenly dipped into the water. Black water of unknown provenance ran toward my feet. Visions of one of those horror movies in which some hapless character falls into a maniac's bubbling vat and emerges as a skeleton raced through my head. I managed to get back to the bank. Forty years later, those 20 houseboats are still berthed there, as they have been since 1960 when they were relocated from another of the city's vanished streams, Islas Creek, which had a wetlands even more impressive in some ways than Mission Bay. Running along the bank a few feet away from them is a delightful little handmade feeling park named Huffaker. Shiny new lawns and sidewalks installed by the city peter out into a stretch of grass and shrubbery as scruffy and well-loved as a hobo's garden. A dusty collection of campers and old cars is parked nearby, apparently having been given some special dispensation from the authorities to remain forever. But forever is running out. I wrote in 2013, forever is completely run out. They're all gone. The University of California at San Francisco has built an imposing high-tech, high-rise complex just south of here, leaving only a few hundred square yards of unused land between it and the creek. Between this last no-man's land, which is already fenced off, run two parallel chain-link fences, which meaninglessly delineate a twilight zone-like lane leading to 7th Street. In early 2012, a few homeless people were camped out in this bizarre walkway. I saw a guy sleeping in a sleeping bag next to a shopping cart and, of all things, a double bass. The musical Clochard and his brethren are gone now, probably forever. For the pitiless laser beam of money has found Mission Creek. The north side has been transformed. A big cluster of expensive new condos rises up with manicured walkways, a dog park, and a fancy kayak shed at the far end. It's only a matter of time before the laser turns to the south side and surgically excises the last patches of urban detritus, leaving the houseboats as a kind of floating museum of lost San Francisco funkiness. In Vanished Waters, Olmsted quotes a houseboat resident, Sharon Skolnick, as saying, 
It's an acquired taste to stick with an inlet that takes your house up six feet and then down six feet twice in every 24 hours, that absorbs the effluvia of storm drains and simulates a sewer, and then two days later wins your heart back with a blue lake duck. The Mission Creek houseboats wouldn't be easy to live in, partly because of the smell, but more because of the surrealism. Mission Creek is deeply schizophrenic. It's simultaneously the most natural place in San Francisco and the most artificial, the purest and the most polluted, the most bucolic and the most sterile. If you lived on the creek, you'd feel the tide rise and fall and look up at a monstrous freeway towering overhead. You'd see sea lions outside your front door and stare up at condos that look like they're in Legoland. And no matter how wonderful it would be to be rocked but to sleep by the water, when you woke up, you'd still be living at 6th and King, across from the train station. And yet, you'd have to be a zombie not to fantasize about living there. Some of the allure of Mission Creek is the idea of living on a houseboat. Having one's own little portable house is a delectable dream, like Mr. Toad's brief obsession with a canary-colored cart. But it's more than that. It's the water. Water in a city is irresistible. Even fountains are a magnet, as any visitor to Rome can attest. But natural, free-flowing water? That's pure magic. There's not much of it left in San Francisco. There's the one-mile-long trickle of Islas Creek and Glen Canyon. The Presidio has Lobos Creek, the city's last major stream, and El Poland Spring, its largest. There's Yosemite Marsh, a small spring-fed pond in an obscure corner of McLaren Park, and the quasi-natural chain of lakes in Golden Gate Park, and a few others. There's more than a few others, but there are not that many still. These places feel like shrines. The city recently daylighted the Tennessee Hollow watershed in the Presidio, and San Franciscans would restore more of their city's lost waters if they could. The great paving over, once seen as the pinnacle of progress, is now regarded as a tragedy. San Francisco's vanished aquatic world is laid out in the elegiac creek and watershed map published by the Oakland Museum, and now superseding that by Joel's Seep City Atlas. Here they are, the waterfall that Anza saw tumbling near 18th Street in Castro, burbling Presida Creek, which cheerfully ran along the northern edge of Bernal Heights, the nameless little stream that ran down Sacramento Street and emptied into Yerba Buena Cove, other vanished waters, such as a spring that once bubbled at Washington and Powell, are there as well. The human fascination with water is atavistic. It's imprinted in our DNA. But for city dwellers, that fascination has a more poignant quality. For cities are museums of time, and to live in them is to be haunted by the places they once were. The waterways that existed before the skyscrapers and freeways are a vanished world that beckons to us. When we catch glimpses of them, the city disappears. Its two known streets dissolve into unfathomable terrain. It becomes innocent again. We want to unmake the city, to regain a lost paradise. And perhaps we are also driven to unmake ourselves, to return to an earlier time in our own lives, one yet not yet marked off with streets and signs, to become again the children we once were, playing with a hose in the backyard, back when happiness was easy and water was everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so now, in the spirit of that childlike joy, um, I want to talk about this fabulous two-day exploration that I made uh, two and a half years ago. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to have not only Joel Pomerantz here, but three other experts, all of whom bring their own unique set of knowledge. 
Uh, one was Christopher Richard, who was a longtime curator of the Oakland Museum, who created the map that I mentioned, a wonderful map, and is also a, a, a researcher of all kinds of things, including like the exact route followed by Anza in his expedition. Uh, an amazing guy. And uh, he, I think, uh, Joel can correct me, was, was Christopher the guy that originally blew the whistle on the false location of Laguna Dolores? Or was he was. That, he was. So you guys may have read about this in the, it was written up in the Chronicle, but the, this is one of the larger m myths um, that has been debunked about San Francisco history, was that there was this Laguna Dolores that existed like at Dolores and 18th Street, where like the terrain does not admit for there being a lake there. And it became one of these historical telephone games where somebody said it. I think it was um, one of the early, uh, probably Zoeth Eldridge wrote it, and it just kept getting repeated. Tur and then that became the location that was cited of the first Mission Dolores um, down on camp and, you know, down by, by Valencia. Turns out now it's well, it seems to be well universally accepted that the original site of Mission Dolores was on the north side of Market Street, actually closer to, um, to uh, Sanchez near Dubose Park. So, um, so Christopher Richard gets props for that. Um, also present was the one and only Chris Carlson, who I, everyone here should know. He's like, to me, one of San Francisco's great treasures, critical mass founder, shaping San Francisco guru. And he, Chris doesn't necessarily have the same expertise on water as these other guys, but he knows about everything about San Francisco. And we were also joined by Greg Braswell, who in addition to being obsessed with water, works for the Department of Public Works. So he knows like every inch of pipe in the city. And if you like, you look at a manhole, it's like, oh yeah, that one was built in 1929 and then it was moved. And it's like, great to have, because on our walk, we were like wandering around pulling up manhole covers. And in fact, that's how we started. We met at Joel's house, and the very th first thing that Joel took us to was a manhole cover right by Turk and Divisadero, and you could hear water rushing under that. So th that was this wonderful beginning, um, and this was part of, I guess, the mythical Hayes Creek uh, waterway. Um, it was mi a misnomer, but of course there are actual uh, significant waterway there. So we started out there, and we ended up, we went literally all across San Francisco, and we ended up at next to a pretty, uh, uh, to a housing project on Alamany Boulevard in the extreme southern part of the city. So I'd like to go, uh, go through some of what we found, and I'll be showing some of the maps from Joel's uh, Seep City Sampler and Atlas, which he was kind enough to allow us to use. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about the scientific side. Um, if you want to find out about that more, look at Joel's book. There are 23, no less than 23 watersheds in San Francisco, including nine major ones. And the way that water moves around through the city is pretty fascinating as it runs into terrain and runs into bedrock and runs into sand. Um, that's fascinating stuff, but if I tried to explain it, I'd get it wrong, and I don't want to be wrong when the expert is here. So I'm going to stick to the history. So um, let's start out. This is the overall, that's the overall map broken into sections. So this is the first one, and this is uh, map B uh, from the book, or tile B. And I wanted to show this one first because it shows the most significant free-flowing stream remaining in San Francisco, Lobos Creek, as well as one of its two most significant natural lakes, a mountain lake, and its most famous spring, El Poland Spring. The, um, but this map also includes, even more magically, some little water courses that almost no one has ever heard of, and which play no role in the city's history at all, but the knowledge of which makes the city a permanently magical place. And I, one of the things that is so irresistible about looking for water is that it sort of tickles two parts of your brain at the same time. The, the Huck Finn, completely innocent little kid part, and the Tom Sawyer, like, I'm going to amass more knowledge about this part. And the, uh, you can, so let, let's start with, start with the Huck Finn part. If you look up at the base of this triangle here, you'll see something called Dragonfly Creek there, and there's a little tiny spring up above it. So <clears throat> this was, uh, these, two, uh, these two little creeks that we went to, I think, you know, all of these, all, all streams make you happy in different ways that you find in cities. I think these two were the ones 
that evoked nature and wilderness and were in the most beautiful, exposed, natural setting, more than any of the ones we saw in those two days. They're in the Presidio, it's a beautiful sunny day, Dragonfly Creek, which really should be called Damselfly Creek because there are no dragonflies there, um, burbles along for 100 yards or so over a log, and you feel like you're in the, in the Sierra foothills. So um, I, didn't, I took photographs which my computer ate, so you'll have to use your imagination for all of, these, all of these, but I commend unto you, go out and find these waters. And the, and the coordinates can actually be deciphered because Joel's book has um, um, the, uh, the street grid, so you can actually find them. And I'll just give a hint, the, the Joel's favorite, he, uh, he said, I mean, you probably have a new favorite since then, um, in this area was, uh, was his favorite because it had no name. Um, and it's right near the intersection of Battery, Wagner Road, and Story. And uh, it's just, uh, the, the, it's, these are really just lovely places. So just a few hundred yards away from these, you know, incredible discoveries are these, you know, the famous ones. So Mountain Lake is really, in some ways, historically, the most significant body of water in San Francisco because it's San Francisco's birthday lake. This is the lake where the great explorer Juan Batista de Anza camped on the night of March 27, 1776, with a small party of colonists who had come up from Monterey. And of course, why did he camp there? He camped there because fresh water, the reason people camp near fresh water to, the, to this day. Mountain Lake is also famous as the place where an alligator turned up in 1996, which led my old boss at the San Francisco Examiner, Phil Bronstein, to don waders in a publicity stunt and try to lure him out. <laughs> but alas, uh, Bronstein was unable to because city officials stopped him uh, citing a regulation that forbade swimming in the silted in and heavily polluted waters. I mean, if you'd walked into Mountain Lake in those days, you would have been like one of those characters in the horror films. Where um, It has since been dredged and is far cleaner than it was before. Now, next to that, directly to the left of Mountain Lake is Lobos Creek. Um, and its waters derive from the same underground sources as Mountain Lake, Contrary to appearances, it's not actually fed directly by Mountain Lake. It's actually fed by water that flows underground from a dune field that comes all the way over by 7th Avenue, um, over by Laguna Honda area. Um, this was, uh, L Lobos Creek is in some ways, uh, has the honor of being the city's first big water source. That was, uh, this was in the, the gold rush days uh, Lobos Creek was the one major source of water. Um, before it was tapped, people, the 49ers, got water from various feeble springs in downtown. Um, a lot of 49ers lived in a place called Happy Valley, uh, which was near where the Palace Hotel is, and drank water in shallow sea poles, and a lot of them got dysentery and died um, from drinking that water. Then they began to ship it over from Sausalito, because there was a big spring in Sausalito, and they would, they would hawk it. Uh, in the streets by the bucket for like pretty expensive prices for a, a cup of water. But the, uh, uh, a couple of businessmen, uh, Chabot and Bensley, in 1856 uh, decided to tap Lobos Creek and they built a wooden flume that ran all the way along the northern waterfront, went all the way around Fort Mason, went to a pumping house at the foot of Van Ness, and then it was pumped to two reservoirs uh, remnants of which still exist on Russian Hill. One at about 160 feet and one at about 300 feet. And uh, that, in 1858, that water started flowing at a rate of two million gallons a day. And um, so that was San Francisco's first significant water source. And um, an amazing fact that a lot of people don't know is that the Presidio still gets its water from Lobos Creek. And if you go into, I went into a Presidio bathroom a couple of years ago and had a big drink of water. I was like, God, that's bad water. That's like, that sucks compared to Hetch Hetchy water. And it's, yeah, it's not as good, um, despite the fact that Hetch Hetchy water is coming from, you know, hundreds of miles away. Um, now, also in this map is El Poland Spring, which is really an amazing site. A lot of you have probably seen it. It is, as I said in the book, it's been daylighted by the city. 
So it's a whole big, you know, public, available, accessible place in this kind of stand of trees. And, um, but this was actually the spring, I think, that really got me first fascinated by San Francisco's hidden waters. And I have to say I have kind of mixed feelings about it being daylighted. Because even though it's wonderful for kids, for schools, just for the general public to know that there's this spring that goes all the way back to, sp to the Spanish days, the pre-Mexican days, and it means the phallus. It was, uh, the, drinking the waters of this was uh, supposed to endow uh, people with great fertility. And a lot of the early Spanish uh, settlers, in fact, would have many, many children. So, you know, it sort of seemed to bear <laughs> that out. But the, um, <clears throat> and the, 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 this wonderful woman, Juana Briones, who we'll hear more about in a minute, so sort of the mother of San Francisco, one of the founding great female figures in the history of the city. She lived right next to El Poland Spring. Um, but the, it, when I discovered it, it was just be a, a little spring behind a bunch of brambles, completely invisible, completely unmarked, no sign, no nothing. And uh, you could walk there at night and just hear this water like Tr dripping out of the side of, of the, uh, the hill there. And uh, it, that, uh, in some ways, that, that moment of, of, not know, of not having it signed, not having it um, n noticed in any way is even more wonderful. So the, um, now, returning to Juana Briones, so she lived on El Poland Spring, um, and she, she was born in 1802. In 1833, so this is like still during Mexican control of long 13 years before statehood. She, her husband, who was actually an abusive guy, um, that she left, but he applied for a land grant and he moved out of the Presidio and uh, moved, to the, <coughs> moved over to the Ojo de Agua Figueroa, the eye of water, literally in Spanish, which is a spring. And the, this is something, this is one of those fantastic little water details that you can go see that is really mind-boggling. Um, he was granted this little piece of land, a small piece of land to build his house on, and he, it was the first, he was the first um, non-native person to live outside of the Presidio. He and, and Juana and their family were the first to live outside of either the mission or the Presidio. Now what's amazing about this is the El Ojo de Agua Figueroa is right at the base of the Lions Street Steps, the place where all of the women in the running shorts, and men too, run up and down those steps, working out. And at the bottom, if you walk down on Lion Street or on Green, there's an indentation in the Presidio wall, in the boundary of the Presidio, which otherwise is completely like straight as an arrow. That indentation is the actual tangible remnants of that Mexican land grant that was given, given to, uh, to, to uh, her husband. And, uh, and they, they lived there, and there's a big redwood tree that still grows up at, down at the bottom there. So they, the water of the El Ojo de Agua Figueroa was still observed as late as 1912. And it's sad that it still uh, fl flows under the basement of, of the house nearby there. Now, in the same, the same map, we also have um, St. Mary's Spring here. This is the, and this is the present day. I should have explained this better. Um, the, the, this is the same terrain on these two maps. The left is the historical uh, terrain. The right is the modern day terrain. And so you can see that a lot of the features, like the big purple lake that you can see in the center there, the Washerwoman's Lagoon, uh, that now is depicted in Joel's map by a faint purple line indicating that it no longer exists, but it's showing wh where its site was before. And, uh, but you can see there are some, fun some features that still exist. One of them is that St. Mary's Spring. And that was, that's a really charming one of all the, we, I think we went in our two-day exploration, we went to about 15 different sites, of which I think this might have been the only one I'd even heard of. But this is really charming because it's in a very swanky residential district in this beautiful church of um, Saint, the Episcopal Church of St. Mary the Virgin. And you walk into the courtyard and there's a gushing spring 
that comes out uh, with a nice fountain that comes out in that in the courtyard of that church and uh, apparently the condition of putting the church here was that they left this spring in perpetuity so that that's uh, that's a really great one to see it's around Steiner I think it's around Union and Steiner I think yeah the um, and of course that whole area was known as Cow Hollow and there were dairy farms there and you know when you have dairy farms you generally have fresh water or probably invariably have fresh water now I think on this map also we have um, uh, Alta Plaza that's another that's another one that I had no idea the park Alta Plaza in Pacific Heights on the south side of the park the um, this whole basin is the headwater of the so-called Hayes Creek that flowed into the sand. This is all spring water. And if you go and walk up on Clay and Pierce in, in Pacific Heights to the south side of Alta Plaza, you will find water leaking out of the bottom of the park. And that's not water that's coming from the watering system. That's water coming from springs. So that's a, um, that's a really lovely thing. Washerwoman's Lagoon is worth, uh, worth calling out. Um, uh, its name is pretty explanatory. During the gold rush, it was used by uh, miners, by Chinese, and then by housewives to wash clothes in. Um, it functioned pretty well for a number of decades, but of, as these things uh, go, it became incredibly polluted and unbelievably stinky. And also, worse than its horrible smell, which was commented on in many newspaper articles of the time, it also carried cholera. So, and, and in fact, a mayor's son died of cholera. So this led to, the, and the smell led to a wide, you know, led to an enormous demand that it be filled in. This is a recurring theme with all of the vanished waters of San Francisco, right up, sadly, until the, uh, you know, until the 60s. Um, it's like, get rid of that water. It's in the way of progress. And the wetlands, of course, that surrounded Mission Bay, Islas Creek, um, all wetlands were perceived in those days as being the bearers of noxious fumes and unhealthy, you know, an unhealthy mixture of, of land and sea. And it was important that they all be covered up. Um, they didn't realize that these are like the most, you know, nutrient-rich uh, ecosystems on, on the planet. But the... Uh, um, all right, let's move on to the next tile. All right, so this is, the, uh, this is the, where the city begins. This is downtown Yerba Buena Cove. And you can see, of course, obviously the most obvious thing, as we all know from the expression, when the water came up to Montgomery Street, um, on the left you can see Yerba Buena Cove. And this is where the ships would come around Telegraph Hill of what was called Clark's Point and put in there all of that now completely filled in, much of it with about three dozen ships which are uh, sunk under the, under the surface there. But this has, there's a lot of great inch early San Francisco water history here. The, uh, the, uh, there's a, one, of them, one of the more charming stories about the history of San Francisco water, of all things, right next to the cable car barn and museum, right on the edge of Chinatown at Washington and Mason Street, there was this little tiny spring that came out of the ground there in the days of the 49ers. And uh, this guy named Ensign sold water from there. It was a, really a trickle. It was like just a few thousand gallons a day. It was not enough, to, not a significant amount of money, but he was very shrewd and he kind of like, you know, got the city f authorities on his side by building a pipeline down to Stockton. And it ended up being that this, <coughs> his, his little, little uh, company got acquired by a much more powerful company, which was the, the same one that had originally run the flume around the, uh, the entire north side of the city, and that's where the name, the Spring Valley Water Company, you may have heard of, they were basically the water monopoly in San Francisco until, I think until the 1930s when Hetch Hetchy Water came in and supplanted them. The Spring Valley Water Company, after their early uh, you know, not very successful attempt to get all the water from Lobos Creek. They then pumped their water from San Mateo from Pilar Cedos Creek over about a 13-mile set of flumes that took it into Laguna Honda Lake. So that was the major. But it's funny that the name Spring Valley comes from this completely tiny little spring where the water would be sold by like hand peddlers. So it's a, it's a, it's an odd thing. Another wonderful. Little, this is, we're going to go into the deepest historical dive on this map here. 
Um, it, at the very base of Telegraph Hill were found um, in the 1980s the skeletons of two 25,000-year-old Colombian mammoths. Right across the street from City Lights, in front of this ugly yellow brick building on the east side of, of uh, Columbus and Pacific called the Pansini Building, um, along with a couple of, like, uh, a giant bison and a giant ground sloth. And when they did the, uh, the, their examination of these remains, they found out that that was all a big bog. It was a low-lying, uh, boggy area with freshwater plants growing on it. And it's actually thought that those enormous beasts, which are far bigger than modern elephants, they may have been killed by predators, but it might have been an early case of, I've fallen and I can't get up. Because if, if, if you're a Colombian mammoth and you fall over in the mud, that's kind of it. You know, you're, not, you're not getting up anymore. And the, uh, so they, uh, that's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, and when you see the terrain, you know, you can see the base of Telegraph Hill. It also then became the Barbary Coast, the most sinful uh, part. So it was a bog in more ways than one. It remained a moral bog as well as a literal one. And there's just so many other wonderful little, little things to point out here. Joel has this one here. This, this was a little rivulet that ran down Sacramento Street. And one of the, it, it actually is related to one of the loveliest anecdotes about the tragic story of the native inhabitants of San Francisco, the Alamu. Um, the first uh, Anglo resident of Yerba Buena, first actual resident of Yerba Buena, William Richardson hired local Indians to work on his bo trading boat, and they constructed one of their beloved temescals, a sweat hut, right down at the base of this stream. And they would jump into this cold stream and then, and then run into the, uh, the hot, uh, the hot uh, temescal and then jump into the water. And they, they did that within... Uh, you know, in the, in the memory of the 1830s, and it's really, pro of all the, it's one of the only and last happy images of the native, uh, natives of San Francisco. It was related to that little stream that ran down Sacramento Street. Okay, let's go on to the next tile. So this one, uh, we went on this fantastic, there's incredible springs, Crane Lake Springs in here, which is right off 7th Avenue in that place where they used to sell the Christmas trees as you, you know, at the base of Laguna Honda. Um, that there's a little kind of a swampy area there. That's, there's wonderful springs up there. There's an incredible spring here. But what I wanted to talk briefly about is this is Woodland cr uh, Creek that runs off of Stanyan and into the Mount Sutro natural area. But on Stanyan, we were, so we were wandering through there. And this is the kind of thing that happens when you're wandering around looking for water. You have these amazing serendipitous encounters. And as we were wandering down, having already gone up and looked at Woodland Creek, we came along and were looking uh, from above at what appeared to be something the size of like a city park. But it's like there's no city park there on Stanyan. And we wandered down to, uh, to Stanyan Street and being the nosy kind of, you know, journalists and explorers that we are, we started talking to the owners of this house whose name was Jim and Vicki Reiter. And the, this was an amazing thing. They own a, a piece of property that has the, as far as they know, and I've never seen anything even remotely close to it, has the largest private backyard in San Francisco. It, it's an acre, an acre. Can you imagine an acre in San Francisco? And the, uh, uh, it, this was originally part of, the, of one of the, uh, the, the Mexican land grants, the Rancho San Miguel. And at one point, it was acquired by this really interesting character named Francois for, so Pioche, who actually owned the Willows, which was one of these, you know, these great resorts. It was on a waterway. And um, it then was purchased by these, uh, these people's grandparents. And the, the, this one guy, and I haven't tracked all of this down yet, so there's a few inconsistencies, but this guy, Victor Ryder, who apparently was the, the guy that first put a nursery there, was, according to uh, Jim Ryder, the, um, and I looked, I Googled him, so this part is true, he was the maitre d' of the Palace Hotel. And he also was, you know, he, he took charge of the Hotel Pfeiffer in Paris in 1885. He was like this, like a Jeeves. He was like a super Jeeves. And he even wrote a thing you can find online, like, you know, Victor Reiter's Guide to Proper Hotel Service. Now, I'm not sure if it was him or his son, because the, you know, it wasn't quite clear from talking to this gentleman. But 
either he or his son became a like incredible horticulturist because if you google writer that name pops up as with as the name of all of these cultivars and the uh, so they they but anyway, so we want, they, these people were kind enough to take us into the yard, which had a working well. It's actually been, they've covered it, but it's, uh, Joel said, there's, it's one of seven wells in San Francisco. And the, uh, so it's very hard to get a permit for a well, apparently. And this, this well is 30 feet deep, and it produces several hundred gallons a day. And the guy said his, his father used to use the water to water the garden, and uh, there's a creeping fig on it. It's beautiful. It has this old wooden bucket. And he said when he was a kid, the dad would drink, dip a wooden bucket in it and they'd drink it. So it's, that, it's just one of these incredible things. And the, I think what is this property is most famous for is they have a Magnolia Campbell and a Magnolia Vecchi, I think a couple of very famous kinds of magnolia trees that have these stunning blossoms. And, then they, and people come from miles around in the spring to see the, the bloom. So it was a, you know, that was what really an astonishing thing to run into. And I think on this same, yes, on this uh, very briefly, another amazing discovery that we came upon on our, um, I think this is still our first day of exploring, was down here by Stern Grove. Um, this is this still live water. It's on the uh, eastern side of Stern Grove, Trocadero Creek. You have to go again. We barged into an old person's retirement home called uh, the Ardenwood and asked if we could walk down behind the Ardenwood. And you go down this steep ravine. It's probably, I would say, we dropped maybe 100 feet in elevation. And there's a pretty live stream there. And that stream once actually went all the way to the ocean before it was blocked by sand dunes. And of course, it wanders then through Stern Grove. There's a great little note. There's an old clubhouse in Stern Grove, some of you may know. And the wonderful historical footnote about that is the notorious corrupt uh, uh, sort of boss of San Francisco, Boss Abe Ruoff of, the, of Ruoff and handsome Gene Schmitz, both of whom were indicted. And um, Ruoff actually went to San Quentin for eight years. But there was a strange, surreal period of time when Boss Ruoff went on the lam. He wasn't actually completely under arrest yet, but he couldn't be found. He was hiding out in that clubhouse in Stern Grove. So, <laughs> Okay, I'll just do like another couple minutes because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. The, um... Yeah, well, we couldn't, yeah, we couldn't do, do this without looking at, at Twin Peaks and the headwaters. This was really probably the most dramatic um, of, in some ways, of the waters. Uh, we went up to, uh, off of um, off Grandview, um, 20 near 24th and Grandview, a little street called Cuesta Court. And there's, right behind you, is the big elevated stretch of Portola. So it's a long stretch. And uh, what Joel pointed out there is that whole hillside has springs. And what's amazing is that the, that the uh, uh, south end of that big elevated roadway is the headwaters <clears throat> of Mission Creek, and on the south side is the headwaters of Presida Creek. And uh, just, uh, you know, and, and there's a pretty good gush there. There's definitely, you know, there's sort of a little riparian, you know, little, little plants and butterflies flying around, and it's right there under, right under, under Twin Peaks. So that was, a, uh, um, that, that was a wonderful find. And there's a couple of wonderful notes about Presida Creek. Presida, um, which is pro possibly the most nightmarish street name in San Francisco, it means pre-condemned to hell. Um, it's like pre-sighted. It's, it's, like, it's a really not a cheerful name. But on the, on the north side, and you can still see a little funny squiggle in this little street that comes out right by uh, Cesar Chavez there um, and Mission, is, was a street that was called Serpentine. And that was named Serpentine because that ran on what was the course of the old Presida Creek there. Oh, yeah, so this one... This is, you know, this shows, this shows Mission Creek and the, uh, and the uh, approaches to Mission Creek. And what's fascinating about this area here is that that area, which all of the, you see the most squiggly parts up here, that's all around where Division Street is now. And it, what's fascinating about that 
And in fact, the curve of division, I think, follows the, the curve of that waterway. But what was really interesting, this is one of the more little known things about San Francisco, that was San Francisco's first homeless area. And what's strange is it, it is still a homeless area. That's the place where they cleared everybody out, where they had all of those, all of those tent, that tent city appeared there. But in the 1870s and 80s, there was a place that grew up on the edges of Mission Creek called Dumpville. And there was like, and Mission Creek, at, in, at, because of all the garbage that was dumped into it, and it was also a very bustling part, the, the most bustling part of the port was further on in Mission Creek. It was so horrible. We talked about Washerwoman Lagoon being odoriferous. Uh, Mission Creek was known uh, in the day as Shit Creek because it was so awful and it, it didn't flow it oozed and it was and just people would like bring all the garbage there was no knowledge of like that you put garbage in water maybe that's not a good idea like there was like the guys were like opening up cans of food and like dumping them out and then recycling the cans they actually did have kind of a recycling center then that they would send them all the way to china so there was some early recycling but it wasn't very environmentally smart so this is Alamany Farm. So this is an amazing place. This is the last thing that we saw on our tour. And if you've gone, if you're driving along Alamany Boulevard, right off 280 at the base of Bernal Heights. So it's directly south of Bernal Heights. And in fact, you can walk from Crescent or one of those big streets that runs along the southern part of Bernal Heights. Um, and you come down and you come upon this like very large uh, open natural area, several acres. And the, uh, they have a, you know, a pretty, it's a, it's a legitimate spring. I think, it, I think it comes out at like, what did the guy say? Four gallons a minute. Okay, well, it's probably not going to, it's not going to serve San Francisco's needs, which uh, just for your information, we consume 80 million gallons a day in San Francisco. So this probably won't do that. But, it, you know, they use it to, you know, help irrigate their, their, little, uh, their little farm, which is a community garden. It was like a city-sponsored community garden, and they have volunteers there. And it's right next to the housing projects. And it's just a, a really one of those magical th places that follow uh, water in the city. And that's, you know, I guess I would just leave you all with almost everywhere where there is water, there's almost always not only a good story in the sense of it's a great story to tell, it's a good story because it makes you feel good and it makes you feel like the world is a better place. And it's just uh, searching for this water in the city with, uh, and going on this great expedition with these guys was really about as much fun as they've ever had in the city. And I, I hope you can all go out and go out and look for water. So thank you. Thank you.